Okay, hello, uh, hello all. Um, on behalf of the Clinical Research Institute at Rambam, the CRIR, I would like to welcome you and thank you uh, for joining us today. Um, for those of you who don't uh, already know me, my name is Shlomit Yilda Yereshev and I'm the director of the CRIR. Um, when we realize the COVID-19 situation does not allow us to hold the annual um, conference of the Israeli Translational Research, we decided uh, not to let the situation to hold back the scientific activity and initiate a series of uh, bi-monthly webinar session with uh, peer speakers who are uh, in normal days uh, very busy and uh, unavailable. Um, for, you, for this uh, opening lecture of today, we were seeking for a leading speaker with a strong affinity to translational medicine research with a valuable record in uh, this field and, of course, a relevance to COVID-19. Um, it is not surprising that uh, our research came up with uh, Dr. Kfir Oved. Phil has uh, over 15 years of uh, combined industry and academic experience, leading interdisciplinary teams combining biotechnology and uh, biochemistry applied in immunology, engineering, and big data in multiple clinical applications. Phil co-founded MIMED Diagnostics and is uh, serving as uh, its chairman uh, of the board after serving for, for over a decade as a MIMED CTO. Um, he holds a BA in biology, PhD in molecular immunology, and graduate the, uh, of the Technion School of uh, Medicine. Fear is the co-author of over 100 granted and pending patents, the author of uh, 16 peer-reviewed publications, and was listed as one of the top 25 voice of precision medicine for 2019 by the BIS research. He was among the inceptors on the AI-based digital health uh, company Navia and served as its, uh, its uh, chief strategy and innovation officer and last year founded uh, Sanofi Immunotherapeutics. Today, Kfir will uh, tell us about host response-based diagnosis in antibiotics misuse SARS-CoV-2 and beyond. Um, before we get started, one technical announcement. You are very welcome to ask a few questions during the webinar, and uh, please do so uh, by the Q&A feature in the bottom of your screen. Phil will uh, take the questions at the end of uh, his talk. So now uh, let's get started. Dr. Phil Oved, please. I mean, thank you very much for this uh, warm intro and also for allowing me uh, the opportunity to speak here. Uh, it's a pleasure. I also had um, a brief uh, look at the uh, participants list and some of them are dear friends and collaborators. So I, um, I look forward to this uh, coming hour. So without further ado, um, we can start. And um, as Shomit said, um, we will discuss today the potential both potential, both past, uh, present, and history of the host response-based diagnostics. Um, we will focus a little bit on antibiotics misuse, a, a topic that many of you know by now uh, by heart. We'll touch a little bit on the SARS-CoV-2 opportunities that the host response actually is teaching us. And we'll talk a little bit more about the future and what's beyond the horizons for when it comes to uh, host response-based diagnostics. The first disclaimer, as Shlomit, Shlomit said, you know, I'm involved in a few companies. One of them that is utilizing the host response for diagnostics. One of them that is trying to deal with uh, improper host response. And one of them that is dealing of, uh, out of the box a host response aspects. So um, first of all, we need to define what is a host response. Um, and the host response very, very briefly is um, our body's response to injury or stress. Um, and that is a phenomena that uh, we can basically see for many, many years in use. So the host response, although has some um, um, new, I would say, uh, new horizons, this is not a new term. Uh, actually, host response is here 
for over uh, a century. And this is just an example of uh, uh, a paper from the uh, Experimental Journal of uh, Medicine uh, where uh, CRP was discovered as a biomarker for pneumococcal uh, pneumonia uh, as an acute phase reactant. Um, and CRP is, of course, a trivial, well-known, well-established post-response or immune response-based biomarker that we're using for many, many years. So even though the term it has some new definitions and is um, combining some new technologies recently, it's not a new one. Now, when we're talking about the host response and uh, our body's response to injury, we actually need to take into account that there are quite a lot of angles for that. The first one, for example, is cardiac biomarkers. We were using, a, for example, the troponin today to diagnose um, both the extent and whether or not there is cardiac damage um, and what type of damage. We also know that we had in the past multiple other biomarkers of the heart. Um, part of the pathology uh, analysis that we're performing is actually a host response based uh, pathology. A CDC is a great example, another example, a, just a complete blood count. It's just another great example for host response based diagnostics that is in, in use for many, many years. And same goes for the sedimentation rate, less in use today, but still uh, served medicine for many, many years, um, and the acute phase reactants. What is not considered a host response? That's also maybe important to note. So genetics, for example, is not considered as a host response. Microbiological testing is not considered as a host response. Uh, also physiological and functional testing of specific organs are usually not considered as the host response and most of the imaging, even though there are some exceptions over there. So taking everything into account, if our body is responding in a specific manner uh, to injury and stress, and we can somehow decode those signals and, and read them properly, we might be able to better diagnose and also better treat our patients. And that is something that holds great promise, both for clinicians, for lab experts, for researchers, and most importantly, for the patients. And um, we need to take that and try to start you know, focusing that. And I'll try to focus today one, on one specific angle of the host response, which is the immune response. Uh, but we need to bear in mind that immune response is part of the host response and not the host response. There are other, as we said, cardiovascular, uh, inflammatory, kidney-related, brain-related, and other types of host response that we can utilize. And we'll try to take the last few minutes to talk about the promise on these angles too. So the first uh, case that we'll present today uh, as an example for host response-based diagnostics is the immune response to infections. And the problem is a well-established problem. I guess you all know it by heart. And that is basically the issue of whether or not to treat with antibiotics. And this is, this is a relatively mild dilemma uh, from a clinical perspective. The vast majority of patients are mildly sick. They're not dying so fast. Uh, um, there is very low frequency of hospitalization for these patients, but still this is a problem that happens about two billion times a year, two billion with a B. There is no other predicate for a disease that prevalent um, that seek for medical assistance. And the problem that might be created is not because of the disease itself, but actually because of the treatment. And the point is that we're not really sure in many of these cases where the etiology might be either bacterial or viral in the vast majority of cases in the Western world, um, whether or not we should treat with antibiotics, which is of course effective only for bacterial infections and not for viral infections. And the reason why this dilemma, even though it's so frequent, is unsolved yet is because that there are current limitations, if, if the, there are limitations for the current solutions. Um, the most important of them is first the time to results. We know that uh, many of these cases are actually happening in the outpatient setting, in the decentralized setting, and therefore requires some a quick turnaround time to result in order to be clinically relevant for the physician, for the patient. Um, some of these infections are actually inaccessible. So even if we have very sensitive microbiological testing to actually sample the left lower lobe, is a very, very, I would say, invasive and not trivial task if uh, one has uh, pneumonia. So that's a, a real gap. 
We also know that we're carrying both bacteria and viruses um, um, with a wide variety and a lot of, uh, I would say, strains and substrains. Again, both viruses and bacteria that once considered a obligatory pathogen. And now we know, you know, the more our sensitive our tools, we know that we carry them both at health and disease. And the fact that we've identified this pathogen in a patient does not necessarily mean that this is the disease causing agent. So quite a lot of a, a, a challenges. We also have the issue of evolving pathogen, a very relevant one. Right now we'll touch the COVID-19 angle uh, later on. But basically all these challenges are preventing us from prescribing antibiotics. And when we say prescribing, I mean a human, you know, modern medicine. And we have about 50% overuse of antibiotics and about not less important, 20% of underuse. That means that these are patients with bacterial infection who do not receive antibiotics. The left part of the equation is not only important because we throw a, you know, we throw drugs down the toilet and, you know, we're just spending money and spending resources. It's also relevant because of side effects that some of these antibiotics has, and most importantly, because we're creating with our own hands um, a new era of antimicrobial resistant strains of bacteria that are becoming harder and harder to treat. And there was this uh, AMR report from Sir Jim O'Neill uh, uh, published in 2016, uh, which was trying to quantify the magnitude of this problem. And you won't be surprised, this is not only a medical, a large medical problem, this is actually a public health, economic, and, and, and multifaceted problem from many other angles. So the idea, and again, if we go back to the immune response, what can the immune response maybe offer us today here? And, and, and maybe, you know, some imaginary solution where we can have in a few minutes with an easy to, easy to achieve sample get all the information we need in order to make these decisions for good and for bad, not to miss bacterial infected patients who require antibiotics and also to provide antibiotics uh, uh, properly, but not to prescribe antibiotics to those who do not need it. And guess what? You know, when we're looking at the host response and specifically on the immune response, we actually learned that the best detection system for pathogens is actually us, our immune system because our immune system is, is responding very differently to bacterial and viral infections. And that is a pattern that we can basically utilize and use for our own a, a use as a diagnostic tool. So we can actually measure the immune response of a patient. And by doing so, by right, measuring the right analytes, by integrating them properly to say, this is an antibacterial immune response or this is an antiviral immune response and guess what, again, the immune system is usually more accurate than most of our currently available solutions. Now, the era of, the, I would say the, the new era of host response to infection started in 2006 with this uh, publication from uh, Octavio Ramilo. Uh, I was then a PhD student. I remember reading this paper uh, at the week it was published. I also had a colleague in my lab who was a postdoc in the same lab at those days, which called me ecstatic about the potential of this, of this finding. And basically what Ramiro showed is that by measuring the gene expression profile of peripheral leukocytes, he can discriminate between bacterial and viral infections. At the time, Ramilo also suggested that we might be able not only to differentiate bacterial from viral infections, but also might be able to differentiate different strains and substrains of bacteria and viruses, a thing that we now know that was underpowered and could not hold truth, at least not in its original intent. But this was definitely um, the gate for a new era of infectious disease diagnostics and the MIMID was actually founded not a lot of time after that, and with a lot of inspiration from this work <clears throat> that was done by, by Octavio Romilo and colleagues. Now, we need to take into account that if we're coming up with a new solution, a new diagnostic or therapeutic solution, it, it doesn't need to be only a, um, you know, I, I would say a novel, geeky, technological nuance. It needs to be a really valuable solution that, you know, overcomes some of the challenges of the currently available solutions and providing better medicine to patients. 
it's not about providing you know more cutting edge technology it's more around closing a real gaps in, in clinical practice. And the immune response of a patient actually is really easy to measure if you're doing that right. So results can be available within minutes. It's relatively easy to use from multiple different aspects. You don't need any access to the infection site like this lower left lower lobe I just mentioned before. Our immune system is completely robust to uh, colonizations and to bystander viruses and bacteria, unless they're invasive. And it's also, a, it also gone through a very long evolutionary process. So it's also robust to the changes of different strains. And again, going back to the, to the SARS-CoV-2, which we'll talk in, in a few minutes, that is something that was shown over and over again the last decade by us and others. Um, that basically, a virus is a virus. There are nuances, but the immune system is basically robust in its response to different viruses. Now, we first study, study the uh, immune response to patients uh, back in 2010. That's the st where, when the study started. Uh, we started with some bioinformatics and some rational design uh, based on specific pathways that we su suspected that might be relevant in the host response to, immune, uh, to, to infections. And with a down selection process, starting with 600 different proteins, we selected proteins in order to make these testing accessible at the point of care within minutes. We down-selected this long list of potential biomarkers into a list of three, TRAIL, IP10, and CRP, uh, which we then combined uh, using a specific algorithm in order to provide us with the uh, differentiation between antibacterial and antiviral infection. And these are the plots of TRAIL, CRP, and IP10. And as you can see, TRAIL is high in viral, low in bacterial infection. CRP is a mirror image of that, as you all well know. Um, and IP10, which we'll talk a little bit more in, in a few minutes when we get to the SARS, is slightly elevated in viral than bacterial, but basically differentiate that, uh, infectious from non-infectious patients. By being able to integrate these three, which are completely independent pathways, um, and behave with a different de temporal dynamics and different uh, uh, half-life time, et cetera, we're able to create this um, multi-parametric model. And how does it work? And I'm trying to put here some, a, a, forgive me for being oversimplistic, but basically you can take the most uh, in, in, um, informative biomarker you have and actually differentiate bacterial from viral infection. The first most uh, valuable one was TRAIL, a, a part of the TNF superfamily. And TRAIL actually differentiates between bacterial and viral infections. Not that bad, with about 80-85% sensitivity and specificity, but we wanted more than that. So by taking those uh, patients and actually putting them now on a two-dimensional plot, we can now utilize the second biomarker, which is viral and use the IP10, and slightly better differentiate those bacterial from viral infected patients. And if we take C-reactive protein and put that into the game, we now have an algorithm based on three parameters in a three-dimensional space, which we're trying basically to differentiate these two clouds of dots, the viral infected patients and the bacterial infected patients. And that's at the mathematical level exactly what these algorithms are doing. Now, I want you to bear in mind that this specific algorithm is not unique in any way. So MIMED utilized currently available solutions. And I would even say that we utilized relatively old solutions because in 2015, when the mathematics for um, deep learning uh, appeared, we now know that we can even do these separations better than what we did them in 2010, 2012, 2014. So once you have enough data, you can actually tether the forces of mathematics in order to make those differentiation very effectively. Now, how does the result look like? I mean, this is a non-traditional res result for a clinician. So those of you in, in the cloud, in the, in, the, um, um, in the crowd that are either clinicians or lab experts or researchers and know usually how a, a, a medical or a lab result looks like, uh, will find this specific answer is pretty awkward. Uh, first of all, there is no quantitative measure here, right? It's a score without specific units. Um, I can tell you, and don't tell anyone, if you'll tell anyone I told you, I'll deny, but this is a probabilistic uh, score. So we're basically talking here about the probability 
for bacterial infection. And therefore, if you're on the left side and your probability of bacterial infection is very low, then you're probably, uh, based on the indication for use, have a viral infection. If on the other hand, you have a relatively high one, you probably have a bacterial infection. And within the middle, we have what we call the undifferentiated immune response, where about 8% of the patients will fall into, where the immune response does not provide us with an accurate uh, result. And that's maybe one of the additional strengths we have in using algorithms is that we can say that we don't know which is not less important for clinicians and patients. Now, this uh, specific uh, product based on the immune response of a patient showed to be very accurate, over 90% sensitivity and specificity published back in 2015. And since then, we already uh, took this, this study, which we called a, the first one called a, the Curiosity, to the next one, which was called the Pathfinder, and then the next one, which was called the Opportunity. All of them, by the way, named after Mars Expedition a, a, a missions, successful ones, by the way, a, and actually validated these, these results in completely external, independent hands of clinicians in Switzerland, the Netherlands, Germany, Italy, and other places. And also a, a raised some really nice publications in pe pediatrics, in the Lancet Infectious Diseases, the PMJ pedi uh, Pediatrics, etc. So, this is basically a concept that we're very proud to say that you know quite a few companies actually joined after MIMIT started. MIMIT started the say, journey of the host response-based diagnostics to infection uh, back in 2010. And I would be very transparent with you that this was not a, I would say, well accepted, widely accepted, and hard to and, and easy to um, to digest concept for many investors, clinicians, and stakeholders back in 2010. Started in 2016, 2017, etc. After our uh, first publications and after Mimit got um, above the radar, we're more very proud to say that uh, many other colleagues across the world joined us in this journey to try to develop tools that are based on the immune response to infection. Among them, uh, Inflammatics, AG+, uh, Predigen, Immune Express, and others. Uh, each one of them with very different or slightly different approach, slightly different analytes, but all of them are actually trying to capture the secrets of the immune response to infection and providing information to clinicians in order to treat their patients better. Another thing to note here, and that is an angle that uh, I will get to in a few minutes too, um, it's really easy to perform those studies. I wouldn't say easy, but it's, it's, it's definitely possible to perform these studies in an academic lab or in a research lab or um, in, a, in a tertiary hospital a central lab. But if you want to perform these tests in the decentralized setting, you need a point of care platform to do that. And that is actually something that we built in the last four years. Um, and the importance of this platform is not in the mere fact that it can measure the analytes, because you can measure those analytes in a central lab instrumentation too. The importance is that you can start disseminating the host response-based diagnostics in many other places where there is no real great solution uh, out there, whether these are uh, outpatient clinics, whether these are urgent clinics, what we call the maram, whether, whether these are emergency departments without an active lab in, in, in the, in, uh, at night and weekends, which is about half of the secondary hospitals in the world. Um, and that opens quite a lot of uh, opportunities, which uh, COVID-19 was actually one of them. So when the, when the COVID-19, when the SARS-CoV-2 arrived, uh, MIMED as a host response-based company immediately you know, joined forces with a few different stakeholders here in Israel and outside in order to see what, what can we contribute, what can we add to this, um, I would say, battery of tools that physicians have in dealing with SARS-CoV-2 uh, pandemics. And one really important thing, you know, we see every day in the newspapers the amount of, you know, the, 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 the death toll and the number of ventilated, you know, and et cetera, et cetera. But we need to bear in mind that the vast majority of patients uh, that are being infected with SARS-CoV-2 are actually asymptomatic. So one of the biggest challenges of the SARS-CoV-2 is that 
out of 100 patients, 50 will be completely asymptomatic, still infecting, but asymptomatic. About 45 will be mild to moderate disease with some, you know, some fever, cough, a myalgia, you know, doesn't feel well, headaches, and, and will be better within a few days without any therapy. About five will get uh, a relatively severe infection, which might even lead to ventilation. And below one, right now about 0.5 to 0.6 globally, will die of the infection. Most of them are elderly uh, patients with comorbidities. And why is that a challenge? It's a very big challenge for the system because we're actually encountering 100 infected patients, but only less than one of them will die or only less than five of them will require intensive medical treatment. And the question is, can we say anything about who's going to be the one that will deteriorate? This is not a tiny question. This is actually a cardinal question when it comes to public health aspects of dealing with the COVID-19, because if we could say who are those five to 10% of patients that actually require tons of care, we could actually allocate most resources there and leave all the others to actually recover spontaneously. So imagine again, now this imagine is again, a solution that within a few minutes and with uh, relatively easy to get sample, whether that is a drop of blood, day, capillary blood or, or venous puncture or any other type of sample, we'll be able to identify those patients that are at risk to deteriorate from SARS-CoV-2. Now, maybe before I proceed, I'd like to tell you what we decided not to do, okay? So we decided not to deal with antigen testing. We decided not to deal with serology. We decided to de not to deal with any other of the, I would say, run-of-the-mill standard diagnostic tools that the world knows for years and there are multiple other companies that can do really, really good, much better than us for sure, in providing physicians with this extra information. We want to actually utilize the host response. And that is something that um, is kind of a nuance, but we believe is going to be more and more dominant in clinical practice in the coming years. So we didn't start a at a vacuum. So when we, when we came to the SARS-CoV-2 epidemics, we already had thousands and thousands of patients from the, as I told you, the Curiosity and Opportunity and Pathfinder and Rosetta and Apollo and many other studies that we run, over 10,000 patients in clinical studies that we made, ran running and will run in the coming year or so. And we had some information about the different levels of the different analytes when it comes to the severity of these patients. So here you can see a differentiation between three categories of patients. Those that were approaching the emergency department in Hillel Yaffe, for example, in Bnei Zion, in, in Schneider and, and other places. Those that were hospitalized but did not deteriorate into severe cases. They were not ventilated, were not ICU admitted, didn't die. And the third category on, in green uh, are those patients that actually had a very severe uh, disease, um, which ended up either in ICU admission, ventilation, or death. And um, as you can see, for example, trail goes down, the more severe the case is. On the other hand, C-reactive protein goes up the more severe the disease is. Again, this is, by the way, well-established. TRAIL was not well-established, but CRP is well-established in the literature. Same goes for procalcitonin at the lower left part, and you can also see um, other parameters, including white blood cells and others. What's really interesting is that, is that IP10, which I, I don't know if you remember, we mentioned before, it's an um, interferon-induced protein, um, uh, actually a chemokine, but did not really show a very clear pattern and the p-value was actually insignificant between the different categories of patients, whether these were ED admitted, uh, discharged, sorry, hospitalized or ICU slash uh, mortality patients. But we had this data and we decided actually to utilize our currently available tools in order to start building a better, a, a better tools for physicians to stratify those that might deteriorate. And here we had, again, the, the point of care platform, which allowed us to have a really fast response 
um, with a cloud-based tool that can allow us not only to perform the measurements pretty quickly uh, under epidemics conditions, but also actually start collecting the data. That is a, actually a very a recent data. It was not available back uh, at the beginning of 2020 when we started this work. But the device right now is a cloud-based device and we can actually imagine a case where we're actually monitoring at the country level, at the state level, at the county level, or at any other level you can imagine, the level of uh, morbidity, the level of severity of those patients, et cetera, et cetera, and can actually not only provide information on the single patient, but also provide some real-time data to decision makers about the number of uh, sick patients, the level of severity in the different territories. So the first thing to measure, uh, because there was quite some, quite some literature on IP10, was actually IP10. And IP10 showed a really interesting pattern in SARS-CoV-2, which was not seen in other cases of acute infection, mainly, by the way, bacterial infection. Because the graphs I showed you before on the more severe side of patients uh, from our recent studies before the SARS-CoV-2, you can probably imagine that the vast majority of these patients were actually bacterially infected patients with invasive bacterial infections, whether these are bacteremia, a urosepsis, a, you know, um, lower pneumonias, etc. Here, these are purely SARS-CoV-2 patients. And what you can see very easily is that there is a very high correlation between the levels of IP10 and the level of severity of the different patients. So this was actually done both a, at the single patient level and also at the temporal dynamics level. And without getting too much into details, just because we don't have the time to get into the fine details today, I can add on top of that, that IP10 is also responding um, in a pretty high correlation to treatment with steroids. So one of the most interesting things, and that is actually something that happened you know, as we, as we went, you know, and performed these testing in, in Bellinson and Asharon Medical Center, which were a Haklalite Corona hospitals, actually the physicians started using the IP10 not only to predict who are those patients that are at risk, but also how much steroids to, to provide and whether there is a good response to, ther to, the, to the steroids administered, both at the quantity and the, the type of steroids that were administered. So this is a little bit about IP10, but I also showed you before that TRAIL2 does have some prognostic uh, value. So it, unlike uh, its diagnostic, uh, uh, I would say, capacity as a marker to differentiate bacteria from viral infections, when TRAIL goes down below a certain level, it stops from being a diagnostic marker and starts to be some kind of a common path of an extreme stress response of our body. Uh, which is becoming actually a prognostic marker. And when we measured that in the COVID-19 uh, patients, we saw again the same phenomena. The trail actually went down. This is, you need to remember, these are viral infected patients. So these are patients where we expect trail to be high at the 100, 120, maybe 80, maybe 150, definitely not 50, okay? And interestingly enough, even though these patients had a viral infection, and even though TRAIL is a viral induced biomarker, the level of stress and the severity of the disease and this common stress path as I, as I defined it, actually reduced TRAIL levels to very low levels, which made TRAIL now not into a, from, a, from a diagnostic biomarker into a prognostic one. And therefore, we took this data and are right now trying to utilize it in order to build a new class of diagnostics that is actually not a diagnostic. It's actually a prognostic type of a testing where patients entering the emergency department or patients who look sick to physicians all, over, all across the medical system, both in the outpatient and the inpatient, um, we'll be able to have some kind of a host response score, a host response, I would say, um, window of the, of the physician to try to measure, try to um, sense the level of stress, the level of injury, um, and, and the, therefore the potential, um, the, the potential for deterioration for these patients 
utilizing or using this uh, host response based diagnostics. Now, I want you to I want you to be aware of the fact that we moved from an immune response into a host response, and this is not, this is not just a nuance. I'm saying that because, for example, low trail is not dependent whether it's a viral infection or a bacterial infection. This is a common stress response of our body. And therefore, trail can serve us as an immune response biomarker, but it's also a host response prognostic biomarker. And I know it's slightly confusing, but um, I guess where multiparametric uh, uh, proteins together with algorithms can actually solve quite a lot of these discrepancies and, and, and confusing elements. Because again, for, for us as human to try to make sense out of these multiple different measurements in our head is quite challenging. Now, when we're talking about the host response-based diagnostics, um, we need to bear in mind there are a few additional applications that uh, the future is, and actually the near future is uh, showing us. The first one is what we just discussed here, the viral versus bacterial. Uh, we discussed that, that's, also that's already reality, that's not the future. So the same goes for the severity scores. Again, MIMED is, um, I think, um, a leader in this respect, but definitely not the only entity working on that. And we know that others are also working on this, uh, on this direction too and trying to measure the, the level of stress or the level of injury, the total level of uh, stress or injury within our body uh, in order to predict which patient is going to deteriorate, which patient is going to, ventil to be ventilated, and which patients are at risk for mortality. A few other indications that go wider in the host response are, for example, questions like infectious, non-infectious. We know that in many clinical scenarios, the physician is actually struggling between the etiology, whether this is an infectious etiology or a non-infectious etiology. So this is definitely something both our immune system and the host response might be able to tell us. Another element that the immune system can tell us is differentiation between gram-positive and gram-negative infections, which we know create slightly different immune responses, and we can utilize this specific element into differentiating these two really important classes of bacteria in order to provide early empiric treatment for those uh, of need in, in, the right, in the right spectrum. Other cases are traumatic brain injury, and as we said, others might be also acute kidney injury, cardiac injury, and many, many others. So I guess just to summarize and to leave a couple of minutes for uh, questions, um, the host response is actually an old, an old concept. We're using here something that is a relatively old concept, serving physicians, lab experts, and researchers for over a century. But what happened the last day, 10 to 15 years is that we got into the era of multiomics, both at the RNA, metabolites, proteins, and other aspects. We have today the capability of artificial intelligence, and we also have the capabilities of quantification, the measurement tools that we have, which are opening completely new era in terms of the opportunity and potential we can, uh, we can have in the host response-based diagnostics. And there are probably multiple other indications beyond those that we uh, discussed today, which are well established around infection, sepsis, severity, um, that are bearing great potential in the cardio, in nephro, neuro, and other uh, uh, parts of the medical practice, uh, where the host response can provide us a completely different and new category of information to better diagnose and treat our patients. And so even though the host response is our, you know, picture of tissue damage and tissue stress and injury, there's also the bright side of how can we utilize this specific phenomena in order to provide better, better uh, treatment for our patients. With, the, with that, I will conclude and just thank the amazing team here in MIMED um, and in many other places that they uh, created this data and are a, a highly appreciated partners in, in the hospitals and labs uh, in Israel and all across the globe, uh, which collaborated with us around this data. Some of them are part of the audience today, including uh, Manit from Ilel Yaffe and the guys from uh, Ney Zion Hospital, uh, Schneider, Bellinson and others. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Phil, for this uh, amazing uh, talk. Uh, you're welcome to ask your uh, questions now. For those of you who joined uh, in the middle of the talk, uh, if you have questions, please uh, use the, the Q&A uh, feature in the bottom of your screen. So, Phil, okay. you can take uh, a question. Thank you. So the first one is actually, first of all, feel very free to ask uh, whatever questions you, you have. And um, um, I guess there are also some, some challenges. So try to be brutal with your questions because that will make the discussion really interesting. Um, the first question was actually around the um, um, SARS-CoV-2 and whether we perform the longitudinal testing at different stages of the disease for each patient. Um, um, and that is um, a question from Suera Asadi, one of my past teachers. Um, so, um, so Suera, um, that's actually an, a great question. Uh, we did have a longitudinal data on these patients that was already published, and I can also send the, the link later on through Shlomit. But basically, um, to make a long story short, IP10 goes up uh, relatively early with these patients. And we know that even though it's not 100% specific, it's relatively sensitive. The vast majority of patients that are developing relatively high levels of cytokines, we know that from our study, we know that from multiple other studies, um, are actually at higher risk to be, uh, to be um, either ventilated, ICU admitted, or even die. So even though it's not 100% spe specific, it's relatively sensitive tool to try to stratify this subcategory, subpopulation of patients. I hope I answered the, the question. Um, any additional questions? Shlomit, anything from your yeah. side? Yeah, I, I have a question and I will take it uh, from here. Um, regarding the strategy you used uh, to choose the biomarkers uh, for mimic panels. So you mentioned you, you first uh, tested only 20 patients. Uh, it seems a very small cohort to, to base on. Can you elaborate on that and uh, if it is uh, statistical at all? Yes. Wow. Um, okay. So, <laughs> so I think the concept is very simple. The problem is realization. And if, you're, if you think about it, if you want to measure in a quantitative manner 600 different proteins, uh, you probably need, and I mean, you have a single assay for each one of these proteins, right? You don't have great multiplex assays, at least not back in 2010. Um, so you will probably need liters of blood from hundreds of patients, okay? So the idea was very simple, and that is, part of, you know, of the method we developed here in immunity in, in trying to identify proper biomarkers. The idea is to put some kind of a statistical threshold, which we know that if we passed, does not necessarily mean that this is a good biomarker. But if you tested 20 patients and it's near random, this is not a good biomarker. Again, assuming you did everything well, so it's, it's actually a way to exclude biomarkers out of the list, not to include. If you want to further perform this, this process, so we started from 600, went down to slightly less than 100, went down to about 17, and then are narrowing down, not down that to three. Now, once you've done that, first of all, if you're utilizing 20 patients here and then 100 patients here, and then maybe 300 patients here, okay? It's, it's feasible, it can be done, okay? And the statistical threshold goes up and up all the time, okay? And biomarkers fall within each one of these steps. At the end, you end up with a, with a signature that was developed based on past data. Now your role as a biomarker developer is actually to perform an independent validation. So you need to take a completely fresh cohort of patients, ideally, ones that represent your target population, okay? And actually test that in a prospective a manner in order to validate that this signature, that these biomarkers are actually, or actually hold truth. And, you know, if you will write, you know, biomarker in the NCBI, in the PubMed, okay, you'll get 150,000 papers 
on, on biomarkers. The vast majority of these works were done on 10, 20, 70, 100 patients or samples, okay? None of that is enough to validate a biomarker. So power here is critical, but we had to do that in a smart way. Otherwise, it would just take a decade to develop these biomarkers. I hope, Pesh, it's very technical, but I hope it answered the, the question. Yeah, you did. Thank you. Excellent. So a couple of uh, additional questions here. Uh, one from Mon Olivan, I own. Uh, so hi, thanks for your great talk. I'd like to ask about the population in elder homes, especially the old and demented, with a different immune response than younger, slash, uh, younger people slash children. So one excellent question about the differences uh, of immune response and actually also host response between different subpopulations. Now, uh, Ron is targeting uh, the elderly uh, and, and demented because he's focused in geriatrics and this is absolutely a, a, a very vulnerable uh, population when it comes to infections. But I can add on top of that multiple additional vulnerable populations. Um, I think there is no short answer for that, but the, 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 the shortest I can provide here is that when we designed our studies, we're trying to be as inclusive as possible without jeopardizing the basic concept. And the basic concept was that we want this, this diagnostics to work from the age of three months to the age of 120, regardless of whether you have comorbidities, of whether you have dementia at different levels, whether you come from a, a elder's home or coming from the kindergarten. Now, our boundaries were proper immune response. So if you're by definition, by the medical hardcore definition, immune compromised, you were not included a, in our studies. So patients, for example, with neutropenic fever were not included. Patients which have um, um, anti-transplant rejection therapies or taking monoclonal antibodies were not included. But you need to bear in mind that the vast majority of population, including the one you mentioned, do not have a, a, this level of immune a, a suppression or, or a immune compromise, and therefore was included in our studies. And actually, quite a few of our patients in multiple different studies were demented individuals, a elderly patients with a multiple comorbidities and, and medications. We can say that even though the immune response or the host response is not identical, we can say that it's similar enough, and the algorithm is robust enough to be able to identify those patients effectively as they were younger and healthier individuals. I hope it answered your, your question. Um, next uh, question from uh, Ron Volchinsky. Hi, Ron. Apart from using the system as a tool for short-term patient treatment, can we get the insight for patients who might be, who might require less intensive care, but will develop long COVID? So, um, the short answer is that we don't know. We don't have enough data, neither long-term data, um, nor enough clinical uh, uh, you know, follow-up data on these patients to be able to answer that. That is definitely something we're still um, exploring. Next question from uh, Dr. Noah Avni. Uh, do you expect different clinical pathologies to have a similar severity patterns applied by the same severity algorithm? So, um, I think, as I showed you, um, the IP10 behavior in COVID-19 was absolutely not similar to the IP10 response we saw in other patients, uh, other severe patients. Therefore, I would be very, very cautious with saying that, you know, a single, a single signature can rule them all. Um, and that is something that's still yet to be, yet to be determined. Um, the fact that uh, some of these biomarkers are being influenced by the disease etiology is, is, I mean, is well established. The main question is how many biomarkers can be integrated and what is the level of independence between them that can actually allow us to build algorithms that can take the good of each one of them without taking the noise or the misleading uh, part of each one of them. And by doing so, to be able to provide more accurate diagnostics, despite this, you know, variable response in different clinical conditions. I hope I answered the question. Um, Shlomit, any, any, I, I think these are the questions for now. And if you have 
any additional ones? And if not, we might want to conclude. You're in mute, Shlomit. Sorry. Um, so I will thank you very much again. Uh, before you leave, I will take the opportunity to remind you that uh, our next speaker will be Dr. Gal Markel. Uh, the webinar is scheduled to December 10. I really hope to see you all there. And thank you again. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure.